wish you a very good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. This week, I have very protective uh, meetings with the president, President Obama, with the vice president, and with the leadership of both houses of Congress. On behalf of the people of Iraq, I would like to tell the American people what I have told the America's leader. Your sacrifices over the past decade to help Iraq were not in vain. Definitely, they were not in vain. And we thank you and our other allies for the assembling the international coalition to support us in our struggle against Daesh and against terrorism in general. And now, as our campaign to defeat these transnational terrorist organizations, a crucial face, we ask you to join us in looking ahead to the challenges that we must confront together in order to defeat Daesh. Daesh is ISIL. It's an Arabic acronym for ISIL. And address the tasks of rebuilding Iraq, reunifying our society, and bringing reconciliation to our nation. We must not only win the war, we must also win the peace, and that's what we intend to do. Together, we must take action against the political, economic, and social problems that give rise to violent extremism, so that terrorism on the scale of Daesh will never re-emerge again in Iraq and in the region, and will never threaten our nation and our neighbors and the international community again. The recent develop developments in Iraq underscore the fact that winning a military battle, important as that is, will not be enough. Two weeks ago, I was proud to raise the Iraqi flag in Tikrit and to join our armed forces in liberating the city of Tikrit. This victory belongs to all the people of Iraq. It was fought and won by Iraqi hero heroes on the ground, including the Iraqi security forces and the popular mobilization forces made up of volunteers from all across the country and the locals and tribal leaders from the governors, governorates of Salahuddin and local politicians. It was also a victory for all our friends and allies, including members of international coalition who helped us win this battle, and of course, headed by the United States. In many ways, the victory of Tikrit offers a case study for how the rest of Iraq can be liberated militarily, and how federal and local forces can work together to ensure the safe return of displaced people to their homes. The images of thousands of men, women, and children returning to their homes under the protection of the Iraqi security forces is heartening. But the battle and its aftermath also demonstrate the challenges that lie ahead of rebuilding Iraq and continuing to reach out, to reach across political, ethnic, and sectarian lines to unite the people. We must continue to crack down on the abuses and excesses of a small minority of fighters that stand in direct opposition to the government's clear policies. We are investigating all of these allegations of criminal conduct. Once corroborated, people involved are held accountable and prosecuted to the fullest weight of the law. Let me be clear, let me be as clear as I can on this. Our government's highest priority is reducing ethnic sectarian tensions and divisions in Iraq. And we have nurtured the close working relationship with parliament and Iraq's community leaders and religious minorities and institutions to ensure an outcome that is favorable to all our people. This won't be easy. 
because of the atrocities of Daesh and the atrocities, atrocities committed by terrorism in Iraq. But this must be done. Many of these divisions are centuries old. Others can be traced to the decades of dictatorship and genocide. But whatever their cause, we must exert our utmost efforts to ensure they do not paralyze the development of our nation. As we move forward to liberate Ambar and Nainawa, Mosul, we will learn from the act and we will learn and act upon the lessons of Tikrit. Mosul is our second largest city and a complex environment, while Ambar is our largest governorate geography. So there is a huge task there. Our goal is not only to liberate Mosul and Ambar from barbarism of Daesh, but also to restore a level of civilization worthy of our people, our history, and our heritage. That is why all the lakes of strategic stool, humanitarian, infrastructure, as well as military, must be in place before our government moves to liberate these areas. We must, fully, we must be fully prepared, not only to retake Mosul, but to rebuild it as well. What is true of Mosul is true of all of Iraq. We must build our country so that it is strong, united, and true to our spiritual and civilizational heritage that we will never again be vulnerable to tyranny and terrorism. As I have often said, at home and abroad, while we welcome the support of our friends and neighbors, partners and allies, this is Iraq's fight to win, and we will win it. As the American people confront the challenges of transnational terrorism around the world, please remember that the people of Iraq who have, who have suffered so much are doing our part to ensure that no other nation need endure what we are enduring at the moment. We are fighting back on the battlefront and we are working hard on the home front as well. Since I became Prime Minister of Iraq last September, the people of Iraq has set about reconciling our society, performing, reforming our government and our military and security forces. It's not easy when we are at war. Reviving our economy and restoring relationships with our neighbors. Over the past 12 years, Iraq has had a succession of free elections. Our government took office in a peaceful political transition in which elected leaders stepped down to make way for new leadership. We want to protect our nascent democracy and honor the shared sacrifices of our two countries that fought for the freedom and liberty we all cherish. Our government represents every political bloc in parliament and every sector of society at the moment. We are doing our best to provide public services, economic opportunities, and equal justice for all Iraqis, whatever their religious confession, whatever their ethnic origin, and wh wherever they live. Our government has successfully concluded a long sought and trim agreement with our Kurdish regional government. This agreement provides for a fair sharing of all revenues and the weapons and support that the Peshmerga forces need to participate fully in the fight against Daesh as part of Iraq's national security forces. We are also restoring relationship with the local tribes in areas threatened or dominated by Daesh. I have met regularly with representatives from the provinces of Ambar, Salahuddin, Nainawa. We are reinforcing our support, increasing our arms supplies, 
and providing humanitarian deliveries, including hundreds of tons of food aids to these regions. We are striving to give all our people a system of self-government that is worth fighting for. As we weed out corruption and incompetence in civil and military institutions, we replace over 50 senior commanders and officers in the Ministry of Defense and Interior. And just last week, we retired more than 300 generals and officers, sorry, officers in general, in the Ministry of Defense as part of the efforts to rejuvenate the armed forces. Military reforms means respecting human rights under even the most difficult circumstances. One of my first acts as a commander in chief was to call a halt to the shelling of residential areas because we value human lives and want to minimize the suffering of the people and the civilians in general who are trapped while the terrorists of Daesh or terrorism of Daesh engages in slaughter of innocent people. Throughout our country, our government is striving to protect personal freedoms and reinforce the rule of law. As Prime Minister, I issued an executive order to expedite the release of detainees who have not been charged and establish a central registry of those who have been arrested. Because a free society needs a free press, I have met with Iraqi journalists and dropped all pending lawsuits against journalists on behalf of the Prime Minister's office. While fighting terrorism and protecting human rights, we are also striving to revive our economy, reform our government, reconcile our society, and re restore our infrastructure. Iraq's, Iraq's oil production has increased. In fact, it is reaching record level despite some of the damage that Daesh has caused and inflicted on our oil infrastructure and installations in the north. But with our reliance on oil revenues for 85% of our economy and federal budget and the decline in oil prices, we have had to take a new look at our fiscal policies and our economic prospects. We have been forced to turn to a new source of revenue, including taxes on goods and services, which is new to Iraq. Still, we are looking to the future. In addition to our energy sector, with one of the world's largest reserves of oil, we are exploring alternative industries as well. We once, we once were one of the most diversified economies among OPEC. We will build a diverse economy again. That is why we are investing in agriculture, petrochemicals, and other industries. In order to encourage economic growth, our government must become more efficient and effective. We need more brain power, more muscles, and less fat. Our government is trying to cut our budget through spending reductions and economic reforms. As you know so well here in Washington, D.C., this isn't an easy task. It's very hard when we are at war, and we have to sustain the community as well. But we are striving to lead by example. While we are holding the line on spending in many areas, our budget includes 450 million US dollars for rebuilding the areas which has been damaged by Daesh and terrorism, which we liberate from Daesh. In a major government reform, we are decentralizing decision making from Baghdad to the local administration and local governments. Decisions about the local populace will be made at the local level by those closest to the people because they, elect, they are elected by the people in these areas. We are moving from a state-dominated system to a more 
vibrant mixed economy. We are privatizing key sectors, exploring public-private partnership, and entering more joint ventures with international companies, including American firms. Through these initiatives, we are encouraging domestic and foreign investment, expanding and creating large and small businesses, and ensuring the government supports not to trifles the private economy, which is very important for us. These efforts are already reaping returns. Major oil companies, manufacturers, and banks are investing in Iraq at present and expanding their operations in our country. Government reforms, economic recovery, and physical and social reconstruction can and must go hand in hand. In an effort towards reconciliation, our cabinet has approved amendments to the accountability and justice law, commonly known as the bifurcation. We need to bridge the sectarian and ethnic divides, but reconciliation is the two-way street. We all must reach out to our fellow Iraqis and reach back when the hands of friendship is offered. Ultimately, the best way to achieve reconciliation are restoring a sense of personal safety for all the people of Iraq and reviving the economy for those without work and the more than a half million high school and college graduates entering our job market every year. To conclude where I began, just as Iraq is working with the United States all, and all our international partners to defeat Daesh, we must also work together to rebuild our country in every way, physically, socially, economically, and politically. We ask the United States and coalition partners to continue to support Iraq militarily through providing weaponry, training, and advisors the sharing of critical intelligence and doing all that you can to stop the flow of foreign fighters, terrorist foreign fighters, and foreign and other foreign groups into Iraq. And again, foreign funds, Daesh is smuggling oil, is smuggling uh, artifacts of our inheritance, and getting money for that. This must, must be stopped. We also ask the United States, our neighbors, nations, our coalition partners, and the International Financial Community to help us to rebuild our country, including restoring the areas that have been devastated by Daesh, and assisting more than two million internally, internally displaced people, refugees. We have devoted hundreds of millions of dollars in scarce resources in our own budget for stabilization fund for our country. We have had useful discussions with the World Bank and the IMF. And we asked the United States and other Western nations, and of course, countries in the Middle East, to assist as well through public and private investment in rebuilding our infrastructure and reviving our economy. For all our challenges, Iraq has great strength and offers great opportunities. Our economic fundamentals are strong, vast energy reserves, and educated population, and rapid, rapid growth before the turmoil brought by Daesh. As we defeat Daesh, we can realize our potential as a business and investment partner with growing demand for new transportation, electrical power, water supply, with, and schools, and new schools and hospitals, and new communication and information technologies. And we will not only become an economic success story, we can become a model for how a society can free itself from tyranny and terrorism and develop an inclusive 
and effective system of good governance on the local and national level. Together, we can and we must win the war. And then together, we can and we must win the peace. We have extended our hands to our neighbors. And as I mentioned before, I feel very free to talk to regional leaders and talk about different subjects, even subjects of diverse opinions. I've been talking to many leaders, including King uh, Salman of Saudi Arabia, and we will continue to do so. Uh, I was happy to learn yesterday that Saudi Arabia has nominated an ambassador to Baghdad. The embassy compound is ready and renovated, and I hope uh, the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iraq is going to be restored as soon as possible. We have our own opinion on the war of Yemen. I ex we expressed it publicly. We have suffered so much from wars in Iraq. We are very sensitive to wars, very sensitive to humanitarian costs. And in our own belief, we think an end to this war of Yemen must be very soon, and the only way forward is political solution by Yemenis themselves. Thank you all for everything you have done for Iraq, and together we can win. Thank you very much. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for those comments. I'm John Alterman. I'm the senior vice president here. Um, the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and the Director of the Middle East Program. Uh, I thought I might start a discussion, then we'd extend it out to the audience. Uh, as you noted, you've been very critical of Saudi actions in Yemen. You're a plain-spoken person. You say what you mean. I want to give you an opportunity to be critical of what Iran is doing in the Middle East. What, what are they doing that they shouldn't be doing? Well, I think uh, the challenges which are facing us terrorism and Daesh, we are in it together. The challenge is not only for Iraq, this challenge is for Saudi Arabia, for the Gulf states, for Jordan, for Egypt, even for Turkey. We must, and Iran of course, we must be together on this rather than polarizing the whole situation. What we are facing in Iraq is a polarization of society caused by this terrorism and of course failure of governance, not only in Iraq, in the whole region. And that is a very, uh, a, a very dangerous cocktail of failures which produce terrorism. I think in, instead of us fighting among ourselves and polarizing the region, we have paid heavily in terms of human lives, uh, 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 damaging infrastructures in our own cities due to this polarization. There is a polarization in the region. It is a regional competition for control, but unfortunately, sectarianism is being used, uh, ethnic differences is being used. This is harmful for us and harmful for everybody. We in Iraq are paying dearly for these mistakes, and that's why we talk in public. I'm not trying to criticize anybody on this. It's not my role to criticize Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, my neighbors. I wouldn't allow myself to do that but I'm very much caring about the Iraqi people and an action there away from us can cause lives in our own country. One of the criticisms has been that in fighting against terrorism, that Qasem Soleimani was very prominent in Iraq. In retrospect, was it a good idea or a bad idea for Qasem Soleimani to have such a, a visible presence uh, fighting Daesh in Iraq? Certainly, it's a bad idea. I mean, we don't accept it. Uh, we welcome uh, the Iranian help and support for us. To be honest with you, it's a very sensitive issue. Iraqi sovereignty is very important for us. Iraqis are sacrificing to save their country. Uh, to make it appear as if others are doing this on behalf of Iraqis, Iraqis wouldn't accept that. So I very much distaste what's been happening. I've been talking to the Iranians about it. They claim it's not them who's doing this propaganda. It's somebody else, I've yet to find who that somebody else is. 
I was talking to a senior Arab official this week and told him you were coming. I said, I have a question for him. What do you think needs to be done after the battle to, to push Daesh out of Tikrit? In your judgment, what needs to be done to win the confidence of the Sunnis for the forthcoming battle to retake Mosul? As to restate the state, the state must be visible for the people and the state must deliver. That's why within 48 hours of liberating the Crete, I commanded that the local police should take charge of the city. People want to see the institutions of the state, the institution of the government. They want to deal with them. They don't want to, to deal with fighters who carry rifles. They want to see a civilian institution in place. And that's why we talked with the governor, with the local, govern, uh, local council of the thing. They should hold their meeting very quickly and they should restore, immediately restore basic services. We want people to have clean water, electricity when they turn the light on, and to have schools and, uh, and hospitals as well very quickly. Later, there comes roads and other infrastructures. But this is, we have been very successful in these areas to restoring basic ser services. Even we have restored mobile services very quickly. You can talk to people in Tikrit now very quickly. That was absent for the last nine months. And this is a, a huge development. I think this is important, that the state must be there. People must believe that democracy works, freedom works, as opposed to tyranny and terrorism. Are, are people back in Tikrit? The reports I'm getting are, are that Tikrit has been, to some serious measure, depopulated through this battle. Well, Tikrit has not been populated for the last probably six months. People just moved away from Tikrit. But the surrounding villages of Tikrit, a lot of people returned. In Tikrit, the problem is Daesh, because it's a vast city, has detonated with explosives, some houses, some government buildings. It's taking time to clear all of this. We need uh, a lot of efforts. That's why we ask our friends in the International Coalition to help us with equipment. What we are doing, we are doing it by hand. Now, I receive a daily report from Tikrit that uh, my security people being killed because they tried to do it by hand and mistakes can take place. We're losing life through removing the detonation of Daesh. This is a criminal act by Daesh, which shows clearly Daesh are not even caring about the Sunni population who they claim they are protecting. When they are defeated in a city, which is a Sunni city, they detonate the whole buildings, the whole infrastructure, they even detonate uh, electrical equipment, uh, water installations, which makes it very hard for us to, to restore, but I'm very proud of the Iraqi efforts, local Iraqi efforts to restore services. In actual fact, in like Al Alam, which is on the east of the River Tigris, east of Tikrit, electricity service was restored within three days. And that's quite an achievement. Given the successes that you've talked about, why do you think Daesh, six months after you started getting significant international support, seems to be moving forward in Ramadi. What explains their, their, their success despite the international support you're getting? Well, see, Daesh is a mobile terrorist organization. They are very, very dangerous. When they lost Tikrit and lost the whole of Salah al-Din, they want to send another message. I think it, it's timed with my visit to the US. They want to show that despite the support Iraq is receiving, we are there to cause damage and we are still there. They want their voice to be heard. That's what they're doing. This is a war. And the war, you can win in a place and lose somewhere, somewhere else. But all in all, if you look at the Iraqi map over the last six, seven months, the green areas, which is the green areas, it means the areas controlled by the government, is increasing. And the red areas, which is a danger area controlled by Daesh, is resetting. Number two, this psychological, uh, 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 well, what do you call it, advantage of Daesh. Daesh has uh, occupied Mosul without a fight through psychological warfare. And they have made people send fear in the hearts of the people. And of course, I have to use this with the media. Daesh are very good at using the media. They're frightening, every, frightening everybody in the world when they show people being lynched, chopping off heads. They're very good at that to frighten people. They want to achieve that so that they win the battle psychologically, not militarily. They don't have to fight. At the moment in Iraq, I think we are being, being immunized against that. The suffering, apparently, and the will of the Iraqi fighters 
has turned this tide against Daesh. Now we can see Daesh are fleeing. They fled from Tikrit, although a lot of them being killed, but they didn't have the will, the remainder of Daesh, they didn't have the will to fight in Tikrit. And that's quite a development, is our fighters have the upper hand in psychological warfare. So that is a, a, an important reverse, and that's why now Iraqi number of Iraqi fighters among Daesh are decreasing rapidly. And most of the fighters we are facing now are foreign fighters inside Iraq. And of course, this has to be put uh, an end to it. I think fighters are still flowing through Syria to Iraq from, from other countries. I think uh, uh, our, our coalition partners must do something about it. What do you think the US needs to do in Syria? I think a lot. Uh, at the moment, everybody recognizes that Syria cannot be solved militarily. There must be a political solution. By all honesty, I haven't seen any movement on that. That's a failure. I think we have failed the Syrians. The international community have failed everything in Syria. About 10 or 11 Syrian refugees, some half of them in internally, half of them externally. Syrian uh, society has been almost damaged. Infrastructure has damaged. I think this is um, something which uh, is very hard on us. Because of this, Daesh were able to develop themselves in Syria and attack Iraq through the border, and it cost us heavily. We will push forward for political solution in Syria, but I think this is the role of the international community. I wish the US administration can do something about it. The, you have to bring everybody to the table. The war is not achieving in Syria, is not achieving anything. All it's achieving, more miseries, more casualties, more terrorist organizations other than Daesh. There are other many, numerous terrorist organizations are springing up in Syria. I don't know where we are heading to. How do you think the United States should prioritize and how much effort should the US allocate to all the different conflicts because we have Syria, we have Iraq, we have this nuclear deal with Iran, we have Yemen, we have Libya, we have Sinai. There's a lot, and, and, and there are some people who say, you know, we're not gonna fix a lot of those, and then there are people who say we have to get involved in all of them. That's the price you pay for being a superpower. I, I don't envy the US. <laughs> but, how, but how should we- I don't like to be in that position. <laughs> how, how should we prioritize? Does, is Iraq the key? Does Iraq have to be one of the top three equal, uh, with equal value? Well, if you look carefully, uh, I think Iraq has been an example where for the first time after so, so long period, Daesh is trying to establish Islamic Khilafah. It's very appealing to a lot of young people. Of course, uh, many people are probably pro-Islamic Khilafah, but what they're trying to establish an Islamic Khilafah which is not related to Islam at all. This is about killing others, about eliminating whoever you disagree with. I don't mind, you may object to what I say, you may object to all my opinions, but to go to the extent of extinguishing them and seeing them off and killing them, that's what Daesh is doing. This is a very, very dangerous phenomenon. If it is allowed, and it can, if we allow it and don't do anything about it, it can expand rapidly. And I tell you, with what Daesh is doing in recruiting young people, not only in Iraq, across the world, and I stress, across the world, we have seen among the terrorist fighters in Iraq, most nationalities of Iraq, American, Europeans, Russians, Chinese even, Chinese now are fighting in Iraq with Daesh. Uh, they are very, uh, apparently they have, uh, I don't know how they develop this expertise of detonating houses. They do it very, in very smart, well I say smart, it's a very criminal way, where you don't find it, you enter the house, you think everything is safe, you wait a while, few hours, then the whole thing collapses over your head, and we have paid a lot of casualties for that. So this transnational terrorism is, is dangerous. It's not only transnational. They're trying to establish an entity on the ground, and no army, no uniform army in the area. If Daesh has developed its capability, no uniform army in the area can stop them. 
So they must be stopped now. And to me, this is a priority. They can extend to Jordan, Egypt. I think the Gulf would be very easy for them if so, they get their hand on that. So what role would, would Daesh or people sympathetic to Daesh have in the negotiations to resolve these issues? Well, we cannot negotiate with Daesh. Um, I think if you look carefully, um, who has negotiated with Daesh? I think Al Nusra was the closest, uh, the closest to them, and uh, see what they've done to Al Nusra. I mean, Al Nusra probably, well, is, is probably marginally less probably than Daesh. I mean, they on the same bed. They have been always on the same in the same bed. But look what they've done to them. I don't think you can uh, discuss anything with Daesh. I've talked even to the humanitarian organization. Uh, what they are doing in these areas controlled by Daesh, they cannot do anything. They cannot even talk to anybody there, even if they want to help the people under the control of Daesh. What Daesh is caring about is they want to establish their state, their, their, their state. They don't care. They don't pay a lot of attention to the people and well-being of the people. That's why they don't carry a lot of responsibilities. They control vast land in Syria and Iraq which represent a state, to be honest with you. But they don't have to pay salaries to the people. They don't have to provide services for the people. They, they only have to account for a small amount of money for them to continue. That's why this smuggling of oil is of paramount importance. It may look in terms of the amount for a state, not much. But for the terrorist organization, this is a lot of money to pay only their fighters and to get weapons so that they can continue fighting. I think. I cannot stress anymore that, including my friends in the Gulf, I know they share this opinion with us. I know they can see the danger of Daesh, but by all honesty, I haven't seen much steps to combat Daesh. There must be steps on the ground because Daesh ideas and Daesh ideology is there, is everywhere, it's not unique. It is there, but Daesh has taken it a step further where they are practicing it. I mean, there are this ideology which does, it doesn't accept the other. It refuses the other. It doesn't want to work with the other. But Daesh is practicing on the ground by killing the other. I think this is very dangerous, and I think this is, to us, this is a priority. So one of the solutions that people have proposed is that, that there could be more decentralization in Iraq, which would restore power to, to Sunni leaders who were there before, who were currently at least acquiescing, if not supporting Daesh, to protect themselves against what they see as Shia aggression. Are there red lines or limits to decentralization in Iraq that you think are important to lay down? Or, or is the idea of decentralization, local rule, something that should be pursued until there are problems? To me, there is no limitations. If you look back over the 11, 11, last 11 years, I think the Constitution calls for decentralization. But why the previous governments haven't done it properly? For simple reason. They were very much scared that if they decentralize, Iraq will disintegrate. This government believes the opposite. If you don't decentralize, the country will disintegrate. In actual fact, to be inclusive, to include everybody in a unified Iraq, you have to give authorities to others. Otherwise, they won't stay with you. If you want to take away all their authority, they will resist that, and they will create a problem. The only way, in, in the opinion of this government, that to, to keep the country unified, is to give more power of decentralization to these regions. And I think they own it. They must own it. Okay. Before we go to the audience, which I'll do in a second, we got a question from Twitter. OK. But it's from Ali Khadiri. So it's, it's not from just anybody on Twitter. He asks, would you favor referring militia members, Sunni and Shia alike, to the ICC for war crimes to promote reconciliation? Well, I think we have a, a good Iraqi justice system. And I'm already referring some of these to the Iraqi justice system. I've arrested a few in al -Ambar, and I've arrested a few in Salah al -Din. I arrested hundreds of them in Baghdad. And uh, one of my ministers was surprised when he visited some prisons to see many of those so-called militia, or they claim to be, uh, that they are in prison because they committed crimes, they were carrying arms, Probably they were kidnapping people. They were killing their opponents. Uh, but we have to distinguish between real fighters and those people who claim to be fighters. In every war, there are people who would utilize the war to their own ends. And we have seen in Tikrit 
large number of fighters, they just got into, got into Tikrit, they didn't fight for it. But because this vacuum which creates after liberation, they very quickly move in and try to achieve their own goals. They put their own slogans. As I made, mentioned in, uh, in Baghdad, I was surprised to see in Tikrit a writing on the wall in Persian. Iraqis don't understand Persians. So who wrote that? For what purpose? What message they want to send? It's very clearly there is a minority there. And they, of course, put placards or photos. Uh, although Ayatollah Sistani has instructed that his photos must mo not be displayed, displayed anywhere. Of course, I call for my photos to be removed from anywhere, including the command centers of my security forces. Uh, but again, there are photos of foreign leaders. I'm sure these foreign fo leaders, they don't want their photos in Iraq because Iraqis are not voting for them. But there's someone there, a minority, who's doing that for a purpose. I think probably they want to antagonize the United States. I don't know. There were negotiations there, Ukraine negotiations and other things. And I think our uh, Iranian friends and Iranian neighbors are very good at that. Thank you. Um, we have some microphones. I will call on uh, people. If I could ask you to wait for a microphone to state your name and to only ask one question because we're not going to be able to get through. People I see right now. I see. In the front row. Tony Cordesman, CSIS. <clears throat> the United States is providing military assistance to Iraq in three key areas air support in the bombing campaign, a train and assist mission to the Iraqi army, and the transfer of weapons. And I wonder from an Iraqi perspective, what are the areas where you would like us to either do more? or do it better? Well, I think you mentioned these areas. I want to do better in these areas, like uh, bombing missions it must be quicker. It is precise at the moment. It's good. But we're talking about time scale between asking for a mission and then actually getting the mission. That's vital, especially when you are fighting a war on the ground. You want the enemy to be hit as quick as possible when you're moving forward. I think there has been some suggestions with the administration. And the administration, as I understand, is very keen to move forward with this, including the transfer of heavy weaponry to Iraq, because we are building new divisions. And there are new battalions and uh, new brigades, which we are establishing about uh, nine brigades to fight in Mosul, and other brigades to fight in Al Ambar. And these new brigades, they need heavy, heavy weapons. And I understand these are on, the, on their way. I hope we receive them on time. So the third row there, uh, Michael Gore. Third row, third row. Um, sir, yesterday uh, Michael, you, can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Michael Gordon, New York Times. Sir, yesterday uh, you and the Saudi ambassador expressed different perspectives on the situation in in Yemen, and you had some very um, uh, blunt comments on that today. You're more conciliatory. Um, have you had any conversations with Saudi officials since those comments to clear the air? And on the opening of the Saudi embassy, this is something people have been talking about forever. Um, it's been in uh, discussion for months. It never seems to happen. Um, when is this actually going to occur, and who's going to be the ambassador? Is there, is there anything concrete on this? Well, first, I always very frank, but consolatory. I was yesterday consolatory as well, uh, but probably some media they've gone out of proportion. Uh, I'm very frank about the situation in Yemen. My intention not to criticize anybody. That's not my role as prime minister of Iraq. But of course, Yemen will have their fallouts on us. This polarization is very dangerous. We are, we are on the same boat on this in the region. If anybody makes a hole in that boat, we all will sink. And that's the purpose of my comments, for my Saudi friends to listen to us. We are only giving some advice on this, some opinion on this. We are airing our uh, thing. We don't want to intervene into their own affairs and ask them not to intervene in our own affairs. 
we have a democratic government, a very inclusive. This is not a Shia government. It may be a Shia prime minister. But I'm only, I'm extending my hand to all Iraqis. I consider all, I happen to be Shia, but I tr not, don't treat Iraqis for what they believe in. I treat Iraqis as being Iraqis and I'm responsible to all of them. And this is uh, all sectors of Iraq society are in this government and are in parliament. So as we are not interfering into other people's affairs, I hope they don't. Add to the ambassador, I heard yesterday, or I think the day before, that a new ambassador has been appointed and I hope he'll take the office very soon. There is no reason why this should be delayed. We look forward to improve our relationship with Saudi Arabia. We're very keen on that. To have an embassy in Baghdad makes our job much easier. Uh, I think we may differ on certain things. And this is our new policy. We don't have to have agreement 100% between us. But this doesn't prevent us from moving forward. Between allies, you don't have to agree on everything. Between allies, there are differences on different aspects. But you still you move forward because the common thing and the common threat are more than the things we are differing about. And that's our opinion. I saw a question over here, second row. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alderman. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Saeed Erekat. I'm a local journalist. I also served in Iraq for five years with the United Nations. Yes, Good to see you again, sir. My question to you on Syria. Is it really realistic to have a, an effective fight against Daesh and defeat it without a more real coordination between Iraq and Syria since you share the same front against this, this uh, group and without really having the neighboring country, especially to the north, uh, sealing their uh, borders to disallow the foreign fighters that you spoke so much about? Thank you, sir. It's a very large border, quite long. And I think the bombing campaign probably is not going to end Daesh, but is drastically reducing the capabilities of Daesh, which is very important for us. And I think continuing to bombing the headquarters of Daesh, fighters of Daesh, because what they're doing, they're crossing from Syria to Iraq and the other way around. So to prevent them from doing that, to reduce their ability for their, and their mobility, I think bombing campaign is enough, is, is, is essential. But as you've mentioned, this is, it cannot be a solution. A solution, there must be a political solution on the ground in Syria. And I'm very much encouraging all parties in Syria to sit down. And I know it's hard, especially there are crimes committed. Uh, we've lost uh, many lives in Syria. There are millions of refugees. But what is the solution? To continue with more refugees? To continue with more killing? Is that a solution? I don't think that's a solution. We've seen wars. And wars uh, only lead to more wars, more sacrifices. And the end, you go back to square one. You have to sit down and negotiate. Might as well do it now rather than later. We'll go right here, and then we'll go over that side of the room. Thanks. Okay. Right here. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council and Almonitor.com. Um, is it in your power to tell the Iranians what to do in Iraq and how many people to send, whether Qasem Soleimani should be there or not? And also, one of, uh, one of our colleagues, Ned Parker, recently has left uh, because of threats against Reuters for reporting what happened in, in Tikrit. Will you issue a statement in Arabic protecting journalists for reporting what goes on in Iraq. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, we must have a say in what the Iranians do and what the Iranians don't do in Iraq. Uh, I've told my Iranian friends very bluntly they are helping Iraq. Thank you very much. But everything must be done through the government of Iraq. Any other way they are doing it, we cons I consider it, and my government consider it as hostile to Iraq. And any, they claim they're not doing it outside the government. They're doing it through the government. And I very much encourage that. Iran is our neighbor. We have the longest borders with Iran. We don't intend to quarrel with Iran, with any of our other neighbors. We have to live in peace with other neighbors. We have suffered for a very long time through wars. We don't want to enter into another war. Having said that, Iraqi sovereignty of utmost importance 
And I think many of the political blocs are with me on this. And the leadership in Najaf, religious leadership, was very, very clear about this. Iraqi sovereignty must be respected. Although we welcome any help that's given to us, but it shouldn't trespass and shouldn't break the Iraqi sovereignty. And that's our position with the Iranians. As with uh, Mr. Parker, Nick Parker, I know him for many years. I've heard his story why he's still in Baghdad. My, in actual fact, my uh, the spokesman for my uh, office has given me a, a message and he told me Ned Parker feels uh, threatened. And I asked what sort of threatening he has received. We want more information so that I can take action about these people who are threatening him. I haven't received anything on that, to be honest with you. I asked for a protection of his office, to increase the protection of his office, and which we did. But I, all of a sudden, I saw, I, I heard he left. I know he sent me a message, he wants to meet me here in Washington, but unfortunately, my program is, um, I didn't have even time to talk to my wife yesterday. So, <laughs> so I don't think I would, I would talk to Ned instead of my wife. And a statement in Arabic? I, I, I think my office issued a statement. In English. Okay, we translate. <laughs> We've broken news. I had a question here and then all the way in the back. So right here in the front row. Yes, ma'am. No, the, the, the woman in the front. I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, that's sorry. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Jennifer Lee Oberhori, and I am with Northwestern University's Medill National Security Journalism Initiative. Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you for speaking with us today. But piggybacking off of the last question about Ned Parker, I was just wondering if you could briefly comment as to your take on the current state of press freedom within Iraq, and also um, in terms of going uh, and taking action in response to Parker's being chased out of the country. Um, what steps are you planning, or are there any steps planned to institute protections for international press covering your country? Since during your address you said, um, and I quote, a free society needs a free press. Um, so I was just wondering if that would extend to foreign press as well. Well, I think if you look at the Iraqi press first, I think they're free to criticize. I think the number one institution which is being criticized on Iraq is the government. We don't even reply to them. We don't do anything. I drop charges against all, all media. Uh, but I ask the media to have their own self-discipline. That's important. The media shouldn't be free to accuse others falsely. They should respect freedom of others. Freedom of speech is there, but the freedom of us. We need facts. Uh, but I refuse so far, and I hope I'll continue on that. Uh, you never know what office does. Office usually corrupt people, doesn't it? But I hope it doesn't corrupt me. Uh, we'll keep on uh, respecting the freedom of the press, uh, protecting it. As the to foreign press, as far as I know, there is no limitation on them, no restrictions. They are free even to go to our within our military unit. I think we went to the extent to allow a free reporting for the front. I remember when the U.S. Army was there in Iraq, 2003. They have embedded journalists. And they were restricted to what they were reporting. I very much respect that. I hope I can have that power to do that. But uh, unfortunately, I cannot do it now. It's so free, the situation in Iraq. Now, I'm not sure if Mr. Parker, why he has left. To be honest with you, I didn't have the, the, the story from him. He wrote something to me. I cannot see why he left. Was he really threatened? Or he felt he was a threatened? I know some, uh, some Facebook Thing and social media has mentioned him in a bad way. But uh, the, the, the thing I've seen, in actual fact, they were condemning the government in the first place, not him. They were condemning me as a prime minister to do something about it uh, rather than him. I know some of these, they want to use these things to just criticize the government in the same way when they accuse uh, the coalition of dropping help to Daesh or accused the coalition of killing Iraqis falsely. In actual fact, what they're trying to do, they're trying to criticize the government for its policies. They don't want the government to seek the help of the coalition, international coalition, 
or to work with the U.S., but I think me as a prime minister, the safety of the Iraqi people, the interests of Iraqi people is number one. I respect what other countries believe in. Their national security is their own, but I refuse for them to interfere into the Iraqi. They shouldn't tell us what is the best of Iraq or what's not best of Iraq. The Iraqi people, I think, decided the end, and I as Prime Minister, Commander in Chief, I can decide for the Iraqi people what is best in their interests. If it is in their interest, I will decide it. The same with our security forces. To show them even-handed all the way in the, on the left-hand side in the blue jacket there. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister Fadi Mansour with Al Jazeera. If I, might, if I may ask my question in, in Arabic, since uh, I see many Arabic journalists here. Um, and then and translator. If you, yeah, and if you don't mind it, uh, uh, Dr. John. Said the Rais Wazara, Sabak Wusulak Ila Lassima Washington Majmua Minal Tasrihat Min Kibalik Mun Bad Mesulin Arikin, Hawlala Habi Asliha Muhadda, Wamutawira, Yakul Iraq and Nobi Hajalaha Fi Muajahat Daesh, Walakin, Hilal Tasrihat Mushtaraka Benak Oben Rais Barak Obama, Narafadal Rais Timtana Rais Obama and Lijaba and Sual Hawlaha Mudua, Women Thuma Al Bait Labiad Nafa and Takun Takadamt, Bimithil Hadi Hilaiha. ما صحة أو ما هي المعلومات المتعلقة بهذا القضية من وجهة نظرك؟ هل فعلا تقدمت بلائحة وهل سيلبي البيت الأبيض هذه اللائحة؟ السؤال الثاني سريعا هل سؤال واحد بس اوكي ثانك يو نو 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 uh, basically, I'm asking you, before coming to Washington, you made statements and other officials made statements about Iraqi needs of a list of uh, weapons and military items that you wanted the uh, Obama administration to provide uh, in order to better fight uh, ISIS. We were talking about drones and other advanced uh, weaponry. But uh, President Obama basically uh, kind of avoided answering this question uh, uh, during uh, the statements uh, you and him made at the White House and only referred to humanitarian assistance. Did you make such requests? Because the White House was, uh, uh, through uh, Josh Ernest, was very clear that you did not make any such uh, requests. So are you asking the administration for anything? And did they uh, answer uh, your, uh, uh, what you're asking? Thank you. Before I go to the first time, I will go to the first time. We actually have a little bit of this. I have been in the media. I don't want to ask for the media. I don't want to ask for the media. ولا السيد وزير الدفاع موجود هنا ايضا ادعى ذلك ما صرحنا بس اكو احد يبدو بالاعلام اراد ان يسبق الزياره بان يسرب شيء هو غير حقيقي وغير موجود وبالتالي احنا بصراحه بالعراق واقعيين ونعرف تحديدات الاخرين ولهذا عندنا طلبات محدده نعرف شو يريد بالضبط واحنا طلبنا اللي يريد شو بالضبط واكو تعاون من الاداره انا بصراحه المثل في هذه الزياره بشكل واضح من الرئيس اوباما من نائب الرئيس حتى من الكونغرس من وزير الدفاع من وزير الخارجيه المست تعاون كامل في هذا الاطار واستعداد لتزويد العراق بما يحتاجه كما ذكرت احنا ما راح نطلب اشياء نعرف من من غير المعقول ان نحصل عليها لان لا نريد ان نعتمد على الاخرين بالكامل خلينا نكون واضح احنا نريد نعتمد على قدراتنا عندنا مقاتلين جيشنا دي قاتل قوات المسلحه دي قاتل I'm sorry, there's no translation. I think you're the translator, but your English is much better than my Arabic. فعدنا عدنا مقاتلين عراقيين عدنا إمكانات عراقيين أنا ما أريد بصراحة لا المقاتلين لا قوات المسلحة ولا شعبنا العراقي أن يعتمد على الآخرين. نعم نريد الآخرين يساعدونا بمقدار بس نعتمد على قدراتنا بالدرجة الأولى مع مساعدة الآخرين نستطيع أن نحقق هذا النصر ولهذا لم تكن عدنا قائمة لا قبل ما آتي. ولا بعد ما جيت ولم أقدم قائمة وإنما تم التركيز على كما ذكر الناس سيد بأن تم التركيز على ثلاثة أشياء أولا توفير القدرة الجوية للقوات العراقية يعني قصف مواقع العدو الأمر الثاني التسليح بشكل عام أكو عندنا يعني معدات اللي متفق عليها منها F-16 منها معدات أخرى متفق عليها بالأصل كيف الإسراع بتجهيزه والأمر الثالث التدريب. Do I do that in English now? Sorry. Would you like to do that in English now? For the for the, the rest of the audience. You want to translate? I, I thought you might translate. 
So you, may, you appoint me as a translator. How much you pay me an hour? <laughs> Let me see what I can do. I work at a nonprofit. You're the prime minister of a state. My, yes. <laughs> I don't think you can afford my hour. <laughs> Just give a little summary, if you would. Well, is, to be honest with you, I think uh, this, uh, I don't know where they came, media report, where they came from. Uh, I think even the administration thought we have some requests. We, they asked us before I leave Baghdad, I said, we haven't made that statement. We don't even have a list in that regard. All we have is there is an agreed list beforehand is to do with other supply. We have two divisions which are under training. They need heavy equipments, which we, we agreed with the, with the US administration on that and with the Pentagon as well. And we have the F-16. This is, uh, we want to make sure the delivery is on time. And we've been assured that delivery on time. And there is no problem in delivering these. And the second is how we accelerate and make the air campaign more, more well, it is accurate at the moment, but more precise and more effective. And there is a lot of talk about this, and uh, I'm glad I've heard very favorable response from the administration and from the Pentagon. In actual fact, the atmosphere was very, very cooperative. And in my opinion, we are on the same line on this. And again, excellent training. Now, everybody is happy now. Training is taking place. It is on track. And we are seeing more numbers of Iraqi security forces being trained. And this is important. We're looking forward to train the police. Police is uh, my, our second phase because what we have seen in Salah al-Din, local police and police in general are very, very crucial in restoring these areas. So we need the police to have the capabilities and the ability to govern and to uh, uh, well, produce security and uh, for the people in the liberated area. Um. We are out of time. Before I let you go, at first, I'd, if we could all let the Prime Minister and his party exit first so they can get out of here and not be late for your next appointment. Before I thank you, I want to thank Rebecca Shirazi and the Middle East program team for organizing this, uh, Carolyn Schroed and the conferencing team for making a whole number of things that seem invisible work, uh, Andrew Schwartz, the external relations team for doing all the things, and the Secret Service. I've never seen so many Secret Service guys in one place. But they kept us all safe, and I'm grateful for that. Oh, thank you. Mr. Prime Minister. Well, they, these are not my, well, it's only a few of my secret service, to be honest with you. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for coming. We hope to have you back, and good thank luck. You. Thank, thank you, John. You. Hard on the home front as well. Since I became Prime Minister of Iraq last September, the people of Iraq has set about reconciling our society, performing, reforming our government and our military and security forces. It's not easy when we are at war. Reviving our economy and restoring relationships with our neighbors. Over the past 12 years, Iraq has had a succession of free elections. Our government took office in a peaceful political transition in which elected leaders step down to make way for new leadership. We want to protect our nascent democracy and honor the shared sacrifices of our two countries that fought for the freedom and liberty we all cherish. Our government represents every political bloc in parliament and every sector of society at the moment. We are doing our best to provide public services, economic opportunities, and equal justice for all Iraqis, whatever their religious confession, whatever their ethnic origin, and wh wherever they live. Our government has successfully concluded a long sought interim agreement with our Kurdish regional government. This agreement provides for a fair sharing of all revenues and the weapons and support that the Peshmerga forces need to participate fully in the fight against Daesh as part of Iraq's national security forces. We are also restoring relationship with the local tribes in areas threatened or dominated by Daesh. 
I have met regularly with representatives so that terrorism on the scale of Daesh will never re-emerge again in Iraq and in the region and will never threaten our nation and our neighbors and the international community again. The recent developments in Iraq underscore the fact that winning a military battle, important as that is, will not be enough. Two weeks ago, I was proud to raise the Iraqi flag in Tikrit and to join our armed forces in liberating the city of Tikrit. This victory belongs to all the people of Iraq. It was fought and won by Iraqi hero heroes on the ground, including the Iraqi security forces and the popular mobilization forces made up of volunteers from all across the country and the locals and tribal leaders from the governor, governorates of Salahuddin and local politicians. It was also a victory for all our friends and allies, including members of international coalition who helped us win this battle, and of course, headed by the United States. In many ways, the victory of Tikrit offers a case study for how the rest of Iraq can be liberated militarily, and how federal and local forces can work together to ensure the safe return of displaced people to their homes. The images of thousands of men, women, and children returning to their homes under the protection of the Iraqi security forces is heartening. But the battle and its aftermath also demonstrate a very good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. This week, I have very productive uh, meetings with the president, President Obama, with the vice president, and with the leadership of both houses of Congress. On behalf of the people of Iraq, I would like to tell the American people what I have told the America's leader. Your sacrifices over the past decade to help Iraq were not in vain. Definitely, they were not in vain. And we thank you and our other allies for the assembling the international coalition to support us in our struggle against Daesh and against terrorism in general. And now, as our campaign to defeat these transnational terrorist organizations, a crucial face we ask you to join us in looking ahead to the challenges that we must confront together in order to defeat Daesh. Daesh is ISIL. It's an Arabic acronym for ISIL. And address the tasks of rebuilding Iraq, reunifying our society, and bringing reconciliation to our nation. We must not only win the war, we must also win the peace, and that's what we intend to do. Together, we must take action against the political, economic, and social problems that give rise to violent extremism. The challenges that lie ahead of rebuilding Iraq and continuing to reach out, to reach across political, ethnic, and sectarian lines to unite the people. We must continue to crack down on the abuses and excesses of a small minority of fighters that stand in direct opposition to the government's clear policies. We are investigating all of these allegations of criminal conduct. Once corroborated, people involved are held accountable and prosecuted to the fullest weight of the law. Let me be clear, let me be as clear as I can on this. Our government's highest priority is reducing ethnic sectarian tensions 
and divisions in Iraq. And we have nurtured close working relationship with parliament and Iraq's community leaders and religious minorities and institutions to ensure an outcome that is favorable to all our people. This won't be easy because of the atrocities of Daesh and the atrocities, atrocities committed by terrorism in Iraq. But this must be done. Many of these divisions are centuries old. Others can be traced to the decades of dictatorship and genocide. But whatever their cause, we must exert our utmost efforts to ensure they do not paralyze the development of our nation. As we move forward to liberate Ambar and Nainawa, Mosul, we will learn from the act and we will learn and act upon the lessons of Tikrit. Mosul is our second largest city and a complex environment, while Ambar is our largest governorate geography. So there is a huge task there. Our goal is not only to liberate Mosul and Ambar from barbarism of Daesh, but also to restore a level of civilization worthy of our people, our history, and our heritage. That is why all the lakes of strategic stool, humanitarian, infrastructure, as well as military, must be in place before our government moves to liberate these areas. We must, fully, we must be fully prepared, not only to retake Mosul, but to rebuild it as well. What is true of Mosul is true of all of Iraq. We must build our country so that it is strong, united, and true to our spiritual and civilizational heritage, that we will never again be vulnerable to tyranny and terrorism. As I have often said, at home and abroad, while we welcome the support of our friends and neighbors, partners and allies, this is Iraq's fight to win, and we will win it. As the American people confront the challenges of transnational terrorism around the world, please remember that the people of Iraq who have, who have suffered so much are doing our part to ensure that no other nation need endure what we are enduring at the moment. We are fighting back on the battlefront and we are working 